This is the third and last video of my second lecture on the fundamentals of transfer functions needed for the development of the extra element theorem. And so the joys of circuit analysis continue. The material in this lecture can be found in my book, Fast Analytical Techniques in Electrical and Electronic Circuits. In this lecture, I will show you how to determine the zeros of a transfer function using a very simple physical interpretation. We begin with the block diagram of a transfer function in which we are going to determine the numerator n of s. In the previous video, we discussed d of s and we saw that the physical significance of d of s was that its roots, called the poles of the transfer function, corresponded to the reciprocal of time constants of the structure at rest obtained by setting the excitation to zero. Now I'm going to show you that the physical significance of the numerator of the transfer function corresponds to conditions in the transform circuit that prevent the excitation e of s from reaching the response r of s. Now, unless you have read my book or seen some of my papers in power electronics, I bet you have not heard of this interpretation nor its use for the determination of n of s. Let us now look at the transfer function and evaluate it at the roots of the numerator n of s. You have to look at both sides of the equality, the right-hand side and the left-hand side. When you evaluate this transfer function at the roots of the numerator, on the right-hand side you get zero, because the roots are the zeros of the transfer function, and when you evaluate it at the zero, then the transfer function becomes zero. Now on the left-hand side, what happens? You have R of s over E of s. When evaluated at the root of the numerator, that also is equal to zero, because the right-hand side is zero. Then we ask ourselves the question, what happened? It's either that Rs goes to zero at the root of the numerator, or E of s, the excitation evaluated at the numerator, becomes infinite. That's the only way you're going to get this side here to be equal to zero. But E of s evaluated at the numerator zero going to infinity doesn't make any sense because I can use any ES, any Laplace transform of any transfer function, and still the transfer function is the same, and the numerator, when evaluated at its root, will equal to zero. So it must be that when the transfer function is evaluated at the root of the numerator, then it is R of S that is going to zero. R of S evaluated at the root of the numerator is zero. This leads to the interpretation that the numerator n of s corresponds to the conditions in the transform circuit that prevent the excitation e of s from reaching the response. This further means that the path from the excitation to the response in the transform circuit at the value of the zero of the transfer function is broken. We are going to reverse engineer this physical interpretation and determine n of s. Now these concepts can be illustrated on the block diagram as follows. The excitation is being applied to the structure and we obtain a certain transfer function. When we evaluate at the root of the numerator, the response goes to zero. We call that a null in the response. While the excitation is being evaluated at the root of the numerator and applied to the circuit or the system. Which we can draw as follows. E of s evaluated at the root of the numerator produces a null response as the transfer function itself when evaluated at the root of the numerator is zero itself. Now all this sounds very strange, but once you see it demonstrated on an actual circuit, you'll understand exactly what we're talking about and you will never forget it. It's trivial. 
I'm going to show you two different methods for the determination of the numerator n of s. The first method is the one that I just talked about, and the second method is the method of the extra element theorem and its extension, the n extra element theorem for an nth order circuit. Both of these methods depend on the concept of a null in the response. In the first method, the null in the response is in the transform domain. In the second method, the null in the response is in the real time domain obtained by what we're going to learn is called null double injection, whereby you insert two sources inside the circuit and you null the response in real time domain by canceling the contribution of one source with respect to the other. I can guarantee you both methods are a lot of fun. So we are going to start with the first method, whereby we examine the transform circuit for conditions that prevent the excitation from reaching the response. First, we recap how to obtain the transform circuit by letting R go to R, C to 1 over SC, and L into SL. And here's the circuit that we've been playing with in the last video. We have one capacitor, three resistors, and an excitation V1 inserted in series with R3, or inside the branch R3, and we're looking at the voltage across R2 as the response. We transform this circuit by letting all the Rs stay the same. C goes to 1 over SC, and uh, the Voltages V1, V2 go into their Laplace transforms. The circuit on the left is the time domain circuit, and the circuit on the right is the transform circuit. The algebra for this method is done entirely on the transform circuit. There is no formalism to this method, just common sense. Actually, doing the algebra on the circuit diagram in general was one of Dr. Middlebrook's favorite methods in his design-oriented analysis class. Let's demonstrate this on the circuit in the next example. So we are going to find the numerator of the transfer function V2 over V1 of S of this circuit. And ahead of time, we do not know if there's a zero or not in this transfer function. We just assume that there is a zero, and we go ahead looking for it. If we don't find it, we don't find it. Then n of s is just one. And if we find it, we found it. This numerator n of s, when evaluated at its root, produces a zero in the response, which is what we show on the transform circuit. This is your first step. You assume that it has a zero, the transfer function, and which produces a null in the response when evaluated at the root of the numerator, like shown here. But we don't have always to write the numerator's roots as k explicitly. Just for simplicity, we can write v2 of s equal to 0, or just v2 equals to 0. As long as you know that you're working in the transform circuit, and you are letting the response be a null at the root of the numerator. What we're going to do now is reverse engineer this result here, this assumption here, that there's a null in the response, and find the numerator. And we'll do this on the next slide. So we say, if the response is a null in the transform domain for some value of s, then the current that is actually flowing through R2, that is the transform current, V2 of S divided by R2, that too has to be zero. Now, that means that with zero current flowing in this branch, the voltage across R4, and of course we're talking about the transform voltage across R4, that's a null as well. That makes the voltage between points A and B equal to zero in the transform domain when evaluated at the root of the numerator. Now we look at the top branch. That was the bottom branch. We got the net zero voltage from A to B. It must be that we have a zero voltage going from A to B through the top branch as well. However, we know that there's going to be some current V 
flowing through R1 because the excitation is alive, evaluated at the root of the numerator. It produces a current in this circuit, which when it reaches at this point will entirely flow through R1. And you don't really need to know this current, as you will see in the next equation. All you need to know that once that current comes in here, bounces around and goes through R1 because there is no current flowing in this branch here. So that current flows through R1 and it's going to create a voltage drop across R1 as well as a voltage drop across 1 over SC. And the sum of those drops is going to be equal to zero. And that is exactly what we write here. I3 of S, which is the current by generated by the source V1 of S evaluated at the root of the numerator, comes here, bounces around, goes around, comes back this way. The sum of the voltage drops across R1 and C must be equal to zero when evaluated at the root of the numerator. And there you go. Since I3 of S is not zero at the numerator, it must be that this is the one that is generating the zero. That is your zero of your transfer function. The root of this uh, factor here, that's the one that's generating the zero, not this. So N of S equals to 1 plus S C R 1 must be a numerator of your transfer function. Because when you evaluate it at this root here, it produces a zero and that produces a zero current and a zero voltage in this branch here. And you're done. This is called reverse engineering. And now we can provide a very simple physical interpretation of this result. If we look at the circuit here, we said there are three branches in parallel. You notice that the branch R1 plus the capacitor C is connected in parallel with the branch R2 plus R4. However, the branch R1 plus C here, or 1 over SC here, its impedance is R1 plus 1 over SC, and that impedance has a zero. When evaluated, this impedance, when it's evaluated at its zero, it provides, it provides a value of zero, which can be interpreted as a transform short circuit. So at the zero of this impedance here, we have a transform short circuit between nodes A and B, which short circuits R2 and R4 and siphons all the current into it and leaves no current flowing through R2 plus R4. And mind you, all this in the transform domain. So that becomes a very simple physical interpretation of the zero of the transfer function from V2 to V1 of S that there is a impedance across the response which has a zero and that zero makes that impedance act like a transform short circuit directly connected across the response siphoning all the current in the circuit and leaving nothing going into the response. Now we'll apply this concept to a more complicated circuit in the next example. We are now going to apply this concept to a more complicated letter network of fifth order and determine the numerator of the transfer function V out of S over V in of S. The transfer function is written in this form, a constant appearing up front, a numerator and a denominator. The constant up front, you can evaluate it right away by inspection by looking at the circuit at zero frequency. And you will see that these capacitors being open and the inductors being short, you have nothing more than a voltage divider between RL and R1 plus R3. So A0 you can determine just by looking at the circuit at DC. Next, the numerator N of S is the one that we're going to determine by inspection using the concept that we just talked about. It is a ladder network and we see that we have two shunt impedances, R2 plus L2 and C2, R4 and C4, and two series impedances, R1 in parallel with C1 and R3 in series with L3. We write these things down. 
each one of these is uh, Z2 of S is R2 plus SL2 1 over SC2 C1 the parallel combination of C with of R1 C1 which is this and Z4 which is R4 in series with C4 like the one we saw a little bit earlier and the series branch R3 plus SL3 two shunt branches two series branches and now the shunt branches that are on the way from the input excitation to the response V0 of S, if they have zeros, their zeros are going to act like the transform short circuit, thereby siphoning all the current generated by the excitation this way, leaving starving the response for a current. Therefore, the zeros of these two shunt impedances must be zeros of the transfer function V0 over V in of S, as they correspond to conditions in the transform circuit that prevent the excitation from reaching the response. Once again, I have two shunt elements when evaluated at their own zeros. In case they have zeros, when you evaluate them, they act as transform short circuits. Those short circuits in the transform domain will siphon all the transform current that is generated by the source. This one will short it independently of this guy, and this one will short it at its own zero independently of this guy. So this and this together are two independent conditions in the transform circuit that will prevent <coughs> the excitation from reaching the response. So, let us look at the zero of the first shunt impedance. You just normalize it and you get the numerator. That's the first factor of your numerator N of S. Factor this one out properly and find its own zero, and you have found the second factor in the numerator of the transfer function. It is a simple zero, left half place zero, and a complex zero pair here. Well, that depends on the amount of damping that you have in the circuit R2. Might be two real zeros, it might be a complex pair. Next, we look at the series branches. The first branch is a parallel combination of R1, C1, and the second one is a series combination of R3 and SL3. The impedance of the first branch is written as R1 over 1 plus S R1 C1. That's the parallel combination of R1 and C1. You, lose, you see that it has a pole at minus 1 over R1 C1. So when this impedance Z1 of S is evaluated at its pole, it becomes infinity. Infinity is an open circuit. And in this case, we say that it is a transform open circuit when evaluated at its pole. Well, when this becomes an open circuit, clearly the excitation cannot make it to the response because there can be no current flow. We're talking about no transform current flow here. We conclude, therefore, that this is a condition here. The pole of Z1 of S is a condition that prevents the excitation from reaching the response V0. Hence, this factor here, 1 plus SR1 C1, must be a factor of the numerator. And that's how you get your third zero of your transfer function. When you look at this second series impedance branch, it is R3 plus SL3. There is no value of S that will make it infinite, thereby interrupting the current in this branch here. So it contributes nothing to the numerator of the transfer function. And this way, we have fished out each factor of the numerator by inspecting the circuit for conditions that prevent the excitation from reaching the response. So let's write all of this down here in factored form. The numerator is the product of these three factors that we just obtained, nicely factored, and your transfer function is uh, A0 with this numerator divided by D of S. Of course, D of S will be determined by using the N extra element theorem. That's a few slides, uh, lectures down the road. But 
You notice by doing the algebra on the circuit diagram, you are able to obtain the numerator very easily in factored form and in meaningful form. This is the value of painless circuit analysis, techniques of painless circuit analysis. Imagine having to arrive at this numerator after writing the nodal equations of this ladder network or trying to do a bunch of voltage divisions between these impedances until you reach the output voltage. An awful lot of algebra you would have had to do just to get to that answer. Here, by using these techniques, you notice that you're able to fish out the numerator all by itself in nice factor form and in nice meaningful form. In this example, we're going to determine the numerator N of S of the voltage gain of the common emitter amplifier with an emitter bypass capacitor. In the previous video, we determined the denominator of this transfer function and A0. And now we're going to determine N of S by examining the transform circuit of this amplifier for conditions that prevent the excitation V in of S from reaching response V naught of S. So we do have to replace the transistor with its equivalent circuit model first. And here's the equivalent circuit model and the transform circuit in which we are going to determine the condition that results in a null in the transform output voltage. We don't know if it's going to happen or not, but we can just assume that it happened and we put it equal to zero and we reverse engineer it to see if we can find the numerator, a polynomial that corresponds to this condition. So we follow the consequence of V naught of S being equal to zero. If that happens, obviously, then the current in the output is going to be equal to zero. That would set the beta IB source to zero. When that happens, it must be that IB flowing in the circuit here should be equal to zero as well. Now, since this is zero, and that is zero, the sum of these two currents must also be equal to zero. That is to say, the current in the emitter node trying to flow into the parallel combination of R and CE itself must be equal to zero while the excitation is going. Or can that possibly happen? It can only happen if this impedance branch connected to the emitter node has poles at which it will act as a transform open circuit. Well, the parallel combination of R, E, and C, E certainly has a pole, and we have seen that before, which we're going to examine on the next slide. So if R, E parallel C, E has a pole, that pole must be a zero of this transfer function V naught over V in, because it will act as an open circuit, reducing the emitter transform current to zero by the fact that it is an open circuit. The impedance in the emitter branch is the parallel combination of RE with 1 over SC, as we've said, and that is equal to RE over 1 plus S RECE. Clearly, it has this pole here, and therefore, this pole is a zero of the transfer function, because when this impedance is evaluated at this pole, it becomes a transform open circuit. So we have determined the numerator of the transfer function, in which it is given by the pole of the impedance Z of S. And now I'm going to complicate the circuit just a little bit more by adding a feedback resistor from the collector to base. This may be an intentional feedback or a parasitic feedback, doesn't matter, but I want to see how this resistor RF will influence the zero of the transfer function V0 over V in of S. Certainly, this is a more involved circuit, and it's a nastier circuit to deal with, and we'll see how we're going to crack it using this technique of examining the circuit for conditions that prevent the excitation from reaching the response. 
So on the transform circuit, we set the response B0 of S equal to 0. And we reverse engineer this result. And we say, if B0 of S equals to 0, then the current through RC must be equal to 0. That sets this current here, IC, equal to 0. Of course, we're talking about transform output voltage, transform output current, evaluated at the root of the numerator, if there is one. Now, if this current here is zero, it follows that beta IB flows entirely through RF. And as it does so, it creates a voltage drop across it, RF times beta IB. Next, we look at the voltage between this node and ground going through this branch and the voltage between this node and ground going through this branch here. This is at ground potential since the output has been nulled. This voltage, as we said, is RF beta IB. However, this voltage here is IB times R pi plus the emitter current multiplied with the emitter impedance, which is RE parallel 1 over SCE. So we have to equate these voltages, the voltage from here to ground and the voltage from here to ground going through the feedback path. And when you do that, you obtain this equation here. IB, as you can see, appears on both sides of the equation. So you move everything to the left-hand side and you factor out IB here, here, and here. When you do that, you obtain this equation. And it is evaluated at the root of the numerator. So, we said the excitation V in is going on, so IB is actually flowing in this circuit. So in this equation here, it is not IB that is equal to zero, it is this that is equal to zero. This is the one that will yield the numerator of the transfer function. So we set that equal to zero, and the rest is a little bit of algebra substitu substituting for ZE 1 over RE over 1 plus RE SCE, as we're going to do on the next page, and determine the numerator. So when I solve this equation for S, I will obtain the root SK. I don't have to write SK in this equation any longer because it's already pretty clear. And we just drop that and keep S in this equation. And now we rewrite it by dividing out by 1 plus beta so that we can introduce some of the other parameters of the transistor model where beta over 1 plus beta we know is the alpha of the transistor and r pi over 1 plus beta is the base resistance the base to emitter resistance reflected into the emitter now if we do that we write this equation in a slightly more compact form with alpha and re instead of beta and r pi and when you just factor this out and set it equal to zero, you get one plus S C E times this expression involving R E, R F alpha and little R E, in which you recognize that this is nothing more than the parallel combination of R E with R E minus alpha R F. So you write that down and you have obtained yourself the numerator of the transfer function because when you set this equal to zero, it yields the root or the zero of the transfer function. So the transfer function now is determined for its numerator. Oh.